The Supreme Court prepares to hear two cases challenging the HHS mandate. A local bishop reissues a pastoral warning about the perils of pornography. We're learning tonight a passenger who boarded the missing Malaysian airline flight using a stolen passport is not a suspected terrorist. And Pope Francis breaks tradition, moving his Lenten retreat out of the Vatican to this small Italian town. Those stories and much more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, March 11th, 2014. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick in again tonight for Colleen. As we look at news now, it's day four in the search for a missing jetliner carrying 239 passengers. The plane took off from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia Saturday. It was headed for Beijing, China. There is no trace of that lost plane. Adding to the mystery, the Malaysian military is now saying the Boeing 777 changed course and then lost signal. It's also believed the plane was flying low. One passenger with a stolen passport has been identified and officials say he is not a suspected terrorist. We believe that he is not likely to be a member of any terrorist group. And we, uh, we believe that he is trying to migrate to Germany. As the search continues, friends and relatives of the missing passengers are coming together to pray. These are some of those loved ones lighting candles at a vigil. Forty planes and ships from at least ten nations are now involved in the search. Senate Democrats pulled an all-nighter last night on Capitol Hill, hoping to bring attention to global warming. More than two dozen speakers addressed a mostly empty chamber, warning of the devastation from climate change and the danger of inaction, and they brought examples. As of 10 years ago, the glacier has retreated somewhat even further from that. But this striking glacier in 1940 is now almost completely gone. This talkathon lasted almost 15 hours with speakers taking shifts. Republicans challenged Democrats to bring a bill to the floor. Democrats currently have no plans to propose such a bill, prompting critics to call the all-nighter a political show. The health care law's birth control mandate heads to the Supreme Court two weeks from today. The high court will hear oral arguments in two separate cases that could define religious freedom in this country. The owners of the Conestoga Wood Specialties and Hobby Lobby craft stores say the mandate violates their consciences because it forces them to provide coverage for abortion-inducing drugs. Now, parties not directly involved in the case who want to share their opinion with the high court can file an amicus or friend of the court brief. EWTN News Nightly's Jason Calvi is at the Supreme Court with part of the story. Jason, how many supporting briefs have actually been filed? Brian, it's one of the largest number of briefs that have ever been filed here at the Supreme Court. 84 in total, 23, uh, 23 uh, arguing and supporting the Obama administration, and 59 supporting those companies. When we stand before God one day, Jason, we're all going to have to be accountable. And you, you, you can't possibly do this and think it's acceptable. The Michelle family says the government's birth control mandate requires them to violate their faith. So the family's urging the Supreme Court to protect for-profit companies under the First Amendment and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. If the Supreme Court doesn't strike this down, uh, companies like ours will be forced to cover abortions all the way up to nine months. And that is personal. The industry, no one had ever done that before, so on a daily basis. The vice president of the company who is a, a product or would have been a product of abortion if we hadn't stepped in and, and uh, adopted him. It's hard for me to justify spending money to pay for the killing of someone like my brother. I mean, how can, a, how can the government take away our rights? Jim Michelle is the president of Electric Mirror. They make specialty mirrors. Here at their plant in Washington State, you can see signs of the owner's Christian faith on the walls. And each product comes with a verse from Scripture. We believe that faith impacts everything we do. So it impacts how we build our products. It impacts how we treat other people. But on the other side of the debate is the Constitutional Accountability Center. They say corporations don't have a right to freedom of religion. Never in the more than 200 years since the ratification of the First Amendment's protection of the free exercise of religion have secular for-profit corporations like Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood 
been considered to enjoy the protections of religious liberty in the same way that living, breathing, individual human beings enjoy those protections. The center's chief counsel, Elizabeth Wydra, says there's a distinction between people and companies. The Affordable Care Act's contraception coverage provision only places requirements on the corporate entity itself. The individuals who own that corporate entity aren't required to do anything under the law, and so they can continue their personal opposition. But the Michelle family doesn't see a distinction between their personal beliefs and their company. In our original document, it says we're a company that's going to promote life, and now basically we have the government really forcing us to promote death. And also supporting the Hobby Lobby in Conestoga Wood, the United States Bishops Conference, the Knights of Columbus and evangelical groups, and supporting the Obama administration, groups like the ACLU and Freedom From Religion Foundation. Brian, just two weeks until things really heat up here at the Supreme Court. All right, Jason Calvi joining us from the Supreme Court tonight. Carrie Severino, the Chief Counsel and Policy Director at the Judicial Crisis Network, joins us now to break down these cases. Kerry, are we looking at a situation here where when a person goes into business in this country, they lose their religious freedoms? That's right. The First Amendment gives us certain freedoms of religion. But what the government is arguing here is that if you are head of a business that is a corporation, so maybe not a partnership, but if it's a corporation, you suddenly lose those freedoms. But the First Amendment shouldn't be governed by arbitrary distinctions of how your business is formed. It should have to do with how you're living. And so if an individual has their sincerely held religious beliefs and wants to live those out in their business life, they should be free to do so just as they are to live out their freedom of speech and their other constitutional rights. Is it a viable option for businesses to simply not offer insurance, in this case, or just pay the fines? Well, certainly. Uh, that has, has historically been an option, but what we've seen is, is there's greater and greater regulation. There are more opportunities for those government regulations to come into conflict with individuals' beliefs. So right now, uh, the fines would be so mammoth that the, the choice between following one's conscience and uh, paying the fines could be devastating for some businesses. And the government cannot be in a position to burden their religious freedom in that way. You have an inside track at the Supreme Court. You clerked with Justice Thomas for a year. What do you think the court will do here? You know, it's, it's always a risk to bet, but I think in this case, we have not only the First Amendment, but an even stronger law signed by President Clinton, in fact, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which uh, makes it even more abundantly clear that religious freedom is, the, is what should win out in this case. The government does not have a strong enough interest. It's giving exemptions for all sorts of other reasons in the law. The government can't now say uh, religion is the one thing that doesn't deserve an exemption uh, from Obamacare when it gives them out for so many other reasons. So I think that, uh, that the, the Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood will actually win this case, and, and hopefully we'll see that as it's argued on the Feast of the Annunciation. So. All right. Carrie Severino, Chief Counsel and Policy Director for Judicial Crisis Network. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Today marks the 10th anniversary of the Madrid train bombings. Spain's king and prime minister joined the victims' families for mass this morning. Elsewhere, people laid memorials at the sites of the bombings. 191 people were killed and 2,000 injured in what was Europe's worst Islamic extremist terror attack. Thirteen Greek Orthodox nuns released by Syrian rebels attended a prayer service at the Church of the Cross in Damascus. They were held captive since December. In exchange for their release this week, Syrian officials released 25 female prisoners. That number was supposed to be more than 100. It was a rare deal between the Syrian government and the rebels who are linked to al-Qaeda and they want to oust President Bashar Assad. Venezuelans demanding an end to violence left their mark on the walls of East Caracas this weekend. People who live there say they're sick of high inflation and shortages of the basic goods like flour, milk, even toilet paper. The protests against Venezuela's socialist-led government are moving into their second month. The government says 21 people have died since those protests began in the middle of last month. The trial of South African Olympian Oscar Pistorius continues this week. The double amputee runner is charged with the premeditated murder of his girlfriend on Valentine's Day. The pathologist who conducted the autopsy on Riva Steenkamp gave graphic testimony about her bullet wounds. Pistorius vomited loudly as he heard the details about those gunshot wounds. Broadcasting or live tweeting of the testimony is banned by judges' orders. Conservatives have now wrapped up their CPAC meeting in Maryland. CPAC is the annual Conservative Political Action Conference. The speakers included Tea Party leaders and presidential hopefuls looking to make their mark on the Republican Party. More and more and more people are making great wealth 
in Washington and Wall Street prospers and Main Street suffers. Young people suffer, Hispanics suffer, African Americans suffer, single moms suffer. We'll bring you analysis of CPAC tomorrow night and talk about GOP direction with a guest from the Republican National Committee. That's tomorrow night here on EWTN News Nightly. Pope Francis may visit the U.S. next year. Philadelphia Archbishop Charles Chaput spoke at a news conference this week about the upcoming 2015 World Meeting of Families, an event many expect the Pope to attend. Philadelphia is hosting the meeting, which supports and strengthens families around the world. And I have great confidence that he'll come. You know, it, 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 I don't think he'll announce a decision until he's ready to do that, and it may be several months before that happens. But I, I have certain, I have confidence that he'll come and join us. The Pennsylvania governor and the Philadelphia mayor also expressed their support for the event. Let, let me say this first. I mean, I've obviously had a chance to talk to a whole lot of folks in my life. Uh, I've never spoken to a pope. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't think you sell the pope. Uh, I think you wait for a decree and, you know, take what you get. Um, the, mayor, <laughs> the mayor and governor plan to travel with Chapu to the Vatican. More on that with Alan Holdred a little later. The last World Meeting of Families was hosted by Milan in 2012, drawing more than a million people from 153 nations. Well, a man you've seen on TV most recently on EWTN is one step closer to sainthood. You're looking at my angel because he cleaned the board. <laughs> Archbishop Fulton Sheen may have interceded for a miracle. A team of medical experts at the Vatican found no natural reason for the healing of a stillborn baby. The case now moves to a team of theologians, then a group of cardinals, and finally to Pope Francis. If the healing is approved as miraculous, then Fulton Sheen would be beatified. That's one miracle away from sainthood. Tomorrow evening, you're not going to want to miss this, we will introduce you to the boy that was healed. He had no heartbeat for 61 minutes after he was born. Coming up on EWTN News Nightly, we'll take you to the quaint Italian town where the Pope is on retreat this week. And a new Pew survey on Francis comes out just before his one-year anniversary. As Pope, you'll find some of the results surprising. It's good to have you with us for EWTN News Nightly on this Tuesday, March the 11th. Pope Francis is on his annual Lenten retreat in the hillside town of Ariccia, just south of Rome. The Pope arrived by bus with members of the Roman Curia, or Vatican government. The Superior General of the Pauline Fathers, who is hosting the group and the main preacher of the retreat, welcome Pope Francis. First up for the group, a visit to the chapel. And where does the Pope sit? Right in the middle pew with other priests, just his style. He'll be on retreat all week. Aricha is about 17 miles south of Rome, and that's where our EWTN News Nightly's Alan Holdren is reporting from today. And Alan, tell us about the Pope's schedule there for his retreat. Well, he's just right down the street from us, and uh, he's going through a week of these spiritual exercises. It's one of the, the first time in recent memory that they've had them outside of Rome. Here in Ariccia, it's just a beautiful atmosphere, as you can see behind me. Uh, and it's an interesting uh, contrast between this time last year. There are a lot of things in common. The Pope is with cardinals today, just as he was last year. But then he was a cardinal himself, and he was speaking with other cardinals about who they would be electing, what they were looking for in a, in a Pope to, to serve the Church. And we caught up with the Chamberlain uh, of the eventual conclave that took place a year ago this week uh, that ended up electing the Pope that we know today. An expectation that was very present in the general congregations was precisely the prospect of the new evangelization. And on this issue, the intervention of the then Cardinal Bergoglio was eventually published. He spoke of a new evangelization brought to the outskirts of the Church, a Church, he has repeated many times, that goes outside of itself in order to evangelize. A flat no to being self-referential in the Church, a yes to the Church that goes out in dialogue with the world, moving out towards all, and the new Pope, said then Cardinal Bergoglio, must be a man who awakens the contemplation of Jesus Christ, 
who leads to Christ, as all the popes have had to lead people to Christ. But he emphasized this point, this effort to refocus everything on Christ. Now that was my EWTN colleague here in Rome, Andrea Gagliarducci, who did that interview. Just a, a real insightful uh, look into, into what the general congregations that prepared to the conclave really were. All right, Alan, insightful there. Excitement in two parts of the world as we prepare for Pope Francis to travel. What do you know about his travel plans today? That's right. We got confirmation this week that the Pope will be going to Korea uh, in August of this year. He's going to be spending three days there. Uh, it's his first trip to Asia, his second trip outside of Italy, uh, and he's going there for Asian Youth Day. Uh, he's also thinking, we've heard, that about going to Philadelphia. This is for the World Encounter of Families in 2015. Uh, we know that there's a delegation coming from Philadelphia, which includes the local Archbishop Charles Chaput, as well as the uh, governor and the mayor of Philadelphia. And uh, they are going to be speaking with Vatican officials about this possibility. And also, hopefully, we'll have the chance to propose the idea directly to the Pope. Yeah, they had a news conference earlier to talk about the plans, and hopefully they'll be able to convince Pope Francis. Alan, thanks for joining us. And as Pope Francis gets ready to celebrate his first year as our Holy Father, a recent Pew poll confirms he's a very popular guy. According to the survey, 85% of U.S. Catholics say they have a favorable view of the Pope, and 66% of the general public does as well. Also, Pope Francis is widely seen as a major change in direction for the church. Other information from that survey, nearly 8 in 10 American Catholics say the church should allow Catholics to use birth control. Roughly 7 in 10 say the church should allow priests to marry and allow women to become priests. And half of U.S. Catholics say the church should recognize the marriages of gays and lesbians. Joining us now to talk about the results of this survey, Dr. Melissa Michella, a professor of philosophy at Catholic University in America. Thanks for being back with us. The papacy is not a popularity contest, but it's no secret this pope is very popular. Do those numbers surprise you at all? They don't surprise me at all. We didn't need a Pew poll to tell us that Pope Francis was popular. On the other hand, to think about the reason why, you know, he has a simple, down-to-earth style, a warm, kind of compassionate approach that people find very attractive. And in accordance with his first encyclical, his style and, and way of talking about things really does radiate the joy of the gospel. And that's a joy that's just magnetic for the human heart. I think many of us have non-Catholic friends who are saying to us, we love this pope. What do you think it is about non-Catholics that the pope appeals to? A hint maybe can be found in something that the pope says in his message for Lent. He says, and it's striking, that the deepest poverty is the poverty of not knowing oneself to be a precious child of God, not knowing oneself to be unconditionally and uniquely loved by God. And the reason why this relates is that with his attitude of mercy and compassion, his call to kind of go out to the peripheries, bring in the people that have strayed, the Pope is in many ways showing to people the compassionate love of God the Father. And that's something that, that people really need. That's something that, that everybody wants and needs and desires. And insofar as the Pope is modeling that, that's going to be hugely attractive. So on the other side, though, we have Catholics saying that they believe in things that the church teaches against. What do you make of those findings? Well, that's nothing new either. Jesus said hard things that people didn't like. When Jesus told people that divorce was just a concession to weakness on the part of Moses and that in God's plan it's not allowed, that wasn't popular. But he didn't change his, his views, right? Jesus doesn't change his views based on popular opinion and, and neither does the church, which is here really just to guard and preserve and and spread the teaching of, of Christ. On the other hand, I think it's important to recognize that there's just a lot of lack of, of formation, lack of solid education on the part of many Catholics that leads to their opinions on this. They, they tend to see the view as, as archaic, as having nothing to do with happiness, but you know, experience shows us that actually, you know, take birth control. It has not been a panacea. It has led to all the things that uh, Pope Paul VI and Humanae Vitae predicted it would lead to. A greater objectification of women, skyrocketing divorce rates, lots of harms for children, uh, you know, worse levels of communication in marriage, all sorts of things that have happened that the church predicted. 
Ending on a more positive note, though, many of those surveyed says that they are praying more, that their faith is stronger now. So that's got to bode well for our church and for uh, people in general. Absolutely. If, if people are praying more, that in itself is a huge success uh, in, in the eyes of the church. If just one person comes back to confession or comes back to the sacraments, you know, that's, that's a huge success. Now, salvation, the concern of the church is not really in numbers, right? It's one soul at a time. And, um, and so insofar as we see even one person, you know, responding to the post message in that way, that's hugely positive. Dr. Michelle, thank you for joining us from Catholic University of America. Thank you. Up next, we'll tell you about an important letter Bishop Laverde of Arlington has reissued on pornography. And we'll also check out a unique sport that's catching on in gyms across America. Don't go away. You're watching EWTN News Nightly and a Catholic bishop here in the D.C. area seeking help from Christians all around the world to address what he calls a plague of pandemic scale. This month, Bishop Paul Laverde of Arlington is updating a pastoral letter warning about the dangers of pornography. Wyatt Spencer joins us. Wyatt, what is Bishop Laverde saying? Well, Brian, the issue of pornography is something that Bishop Laverde takes very seriously. Specifically, he's warning about rise in pornography use and addiction as a result of that. The letter itself is called Bought with a Price. It's actually being reissued this month after the bishop said that it's greater need now than when he first wrote it back in 2006. And it's just engulfing so many wonderful people that are young and old and married and single, especially our young people. And so we need to have everyone, but especially fathers and mothers, and uh, to know the, the evils and to protect their young ones. Bishop Laverde doesn't hold back telling you what he really thinks about pornography and the $13 billion porn industry in his pastoral letter. The victims of this plague are countless, he says. For participants, he says it reduces the human person to an object. For viewers, though, he says it's far worse than just a bad habit. They are being more and more seduced into wanting more and more of this intense kind of, of uh, pleasure that they get from it. And he says it's no secret the rise of internet use has played a key role in the rise of pornography use. Dr. Paul Vitz, who teaches at the Institute for Psychological Sciences in Arlington, says addiction and increased use causes practical problems, especially for young men. Frankly, it's very narcissistic. It's all focused on you. And that sort of permanently constricts their understanding of, of of sexuality, of women, of personal relationships, they become uh, interpersonally less skilled. So the bishop is calling on all those of goodwill, individuals and families, to remember the virtue of purity and respect for other people. A human person it, it has infinite worth, and so we need to be able to look at, at people differently, not as people who mean something in themselves, not for what they do, for who they are. In Washington, Wyatt Spencer, EWTN News Nightly. We're joined by Damon Owens, who is executive director of the Theology of the Body Institute. And Damon, we don't often talk about pornography like we do some of the other hot button issues. How big of a problem is this? And it is, is it just a problem for men? From every quarter that we've heard from our students at the Theology Body Institute, psychologists, therapists, uh, folks work on the internet, this is a huge problem, a problem that is growing. And I think Bishop Laverty spoke very clearly about that, even since his uh, initial or at least of that document back in uh, 1996. It actually was in 2006, 2006 that it originally came out. And of course, the, the uh, internet has really just opened this up so widely to people. But there are those who would say that this is a personal issue. You know, no one else is getting hurt. How would you address that? Again, one of the beautiful things that Bishop Laverty reiterated in his, in his pastoral letter was the universal harm of uh, pornography. It's not just private. It's not just public. It's one of those topics that has equally private and public. Therefore, it requires both private diligence and our own exposure, as well as advocacy and making sure that we really set the tone that uh, it deserves no respect. Yeah, when you think of all the 
people, especially women and children who are victimized in this industry, but don't you think also that indulging in porn, as the bishop pointed out, really affects the rest of our lives? Without a doubt. And we speak specifically about men because men and women are both affected by porn. We need to be very clear about that, but in different ways. And the distinction of those really makes uh, important in how we address both the uh, keeping from it, keeping ourselves from it, as well as recovery, and also keeping it within the realm of the human person. This is what's so important, that we look at this as we look at most sin, and all sin, in fact, as first decisions and exposure, and then how the effect on ourselves and then the broader culture. Pornography is pervasive, and I'm so glad the church has taken such a more serious position in leadership. Any quick practical advice you might have to try to counter this problem? You know, again, we look back into the tradition and of our, of our faith and the things that are so beautiful. We need community. We need uh, accountability. We need to recognize first a vision of the beauty and the dignity of the person, of sexuality, masculinity, femininity. And with that vision, then we're able to make these decisions about what we expose ourselves to, what we do not. But also this awareness gives us a sense of urgency of what we need to do in prayer, in the sacrament of reconciliation, and, and also uh, how we speak to young people, how we speak to ourselves and our wives, how we view marriage. It's such a pervasive problem that it requires us to, in a very practical way to take awareness, to, see, to be uh, active in, in choosing the, the gifts of our faith, but also then as advocacy for the public problem. All right, Damon Owens, thanks for riding the rail down from Philadelphia to join us here in D.C. from nice the Theology of the Body Institute. Thank you. Well, a sport that kids and many movie buffs may find thrilling is gaining in popularity. It's called parkour. Never heard of it? Check it out. It's an action movie staple. Good guys and bad guys running, jumping, and rolling up and over buildings and obstacles. Like this scene in the James Bond movie Casino Royale. But how do they do it? The answer is parkour. Parkour in its simplest form is probably running, jumping, and climbing. The sport uses elements from many others, including martial arts, gymnastics, rock climbing. Yes, better, much better. Most of parkour is based on navigating your way through an environment and a lot of other disciplines don't have that same goal. It was developed in France in the 1980s and gained attention worldwide thanks to videos posted online. But the sport is more than just the flashy stunts you can find on YouTube. I think most people see it more as a functional way to get fit. A way to break away from the routine of the gym and for some, a chance to feel like they are back at the playground. It's, uh, it reminds me of being a kid again, like monkeying around on anything and everything, clambering about. Um, generally having fun while getting around. The only equipment you need to provide is light clothing and running shoes. And it's really all about your flow, how you, the, the flow of your movements and, and with your mind, which is really cool. So it's a nice connection between your mind and your body. And while the movies can make it seem so fluid and easy, injuries yeah. are real. Okay? And instructors yeah. urge newcomers to take it one step at a time. Yeah, don't try to do that at home. Hey, we hope you'll like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Of course, you can catch our news again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching. God bless you and good night.